The Ready to Learn Learning Triangle is a teaching tool. It addresses various learning styles and engages different senses. This workshop is based on these three principles, view, read, and do. Today we're going to talk about storytelling, one of my favorite things, but let's define what storytelling is. Teresa, tell me what's different about storytelling and maybe reading a book. What is different? If you could tell a story, you are using your voice a lot more and expression and hand, your hands and things, whereas a book you may just be pointing to the pages. Okay. All right. Melanie, any ideas of what, uh, why storytelling is different? Why are we even talking about it? It seems like storytelling is a little bit harder. I think that's because it involves more creativity and more coming up with things yourself not just relying on a book. Okay, that is a very good idea. It is a little bit harder, and that's one thing I want you to remember is storytelling, you have to practice. It's not something that you can just do automatically. It's something that you need to actually take some time to practice. Okay, what about you? What do you think, why do you think storytelling is different or why we're even talking about it? Um, because you don't always have to use a book. Okay, you have it memorized, which makes it hard for me not being able to say all my children's names and mixing them up, it is a little bit harder, but it does not always require a book. Most of the time, because I don't have a great imagination, I can't make up my own stories, I do rely on a book. And so I'll take a book, I'll memorize it, I'll tell it the way I want to, and then I am still using my voice, we're still being creative, we're still not using a book, but we're telling a story. And we're gonna talk about a lot of different ways that to tell a story. What are some tools that you need to be a good storyteller? And the first one is imagination. Um, in imagination, it not only is the person telling the story, but it's the person that's listening to the story that's actually going to use a lot of that imagination. I'm going to tell a story, one of my favorite stories, it's called Silly Sally by Audrey Wood, and you're going to use your imagination by creating an image of what Silly Sally looks like. Okay, I want you to think, okay, what is she doing? So how would she act? What is she saying? So how would she look? Those kind of things make up a person. And I want you to create that in your mind as I tell you Silly Sally. Now, in the book, it doesn't have the sing-songy like I do, but to help me remember it, I do it sort of sing-songy so I know what comes next, What's the end? What's the beginning? What's the middle? So here we go. Silly Sally went to town walking backwards, upside down. On the way, she met a dog. Silly dog, they played leapfrog. Silly Sally went to town leaping backwards, upside down. On the way, she met a pig. Silly pig, they danced the jig. Silly Sally went to town dancing backwards, upside down. On the way they met a loon. What's a loon, Rachel? It's like a duck. A silly duck, silly loon, they played a tune. Now this silly loon actually had a flute. Imagine that. So I want you to get a flute out, and when I say that part, I want you to do toot, 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 toot for me, okay? Silly Sally went to town, dancing backwards, upside down. On the way they met a loon, silly loon, they played a tune. Toot, 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 toot. Very good. Silly Sally went to town singing backwards, upside down. On the way they met a sheep. Oh, this is something we all want to do. Silly sheep, they fell asleep. Oh no, how silly Sally gonna get to town? Sleeping backwards, upside down. Well, lucky for Silly Sally, along came Natty Buttercup that tickled the dog that played leapfrog, that tickled the pig that danced the jig, that tickled the loon that played the tune, toot, 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 that tickled the sheep who woke right up. And that's how Silly Sally got to town, walking backwards, upside down. Okay, Teresa, what did your Silly Sally look like? Um, she's about eight, just kind of bouncy and energetic. Okay, very energetic to be walking backwards, upside down. Okay, I'm just showing you what she could be doing. John, what does your silly Sally look like? I pictured a tomboy in jeans. Okay, all right. Yeah, because walking upside down, you know, you don't want to wear a big dress, but you know, I want to show you a picture of silly Sally. She actually does have a dress, lots of ruffles under this dress. Anybody picture her hair, anything like this? 
Okay, sort of messy, crazy. A lot of times when I tell this story to children, I'll ask them and they usually will say Pippi Longstocking. A lot of them will refer to her as Pippi Longstocking. Now, um, as I read this book, I probably <coughs> didn't write it the way Audrey Rourke I didn't tell it the way Audrey Rudd wrote it, but I, there's only one character that makes the climax of the story. And what was that? Lauren, what was the only one that I had to remember? The sheep, because that's what fell asleep, else we would have been going on and on and on and on. Now, Nettie Buttercup is pretty important too, but we could have something else. Now, as, so when you tell a story, there's usually only one element that you need to know. As we use this story, we're going to talk about the benefits of storytelling. Why storytelling is so important, how it helps children learn to read. And we're going to use, come back to the story quite a bit and refer to it as how it is beneficial. So we're going to just pull up some benefits of storytelling and talk about each of those as it will help children prepare to read. Scholastic Vic did a study and they showed that these are the benefits that come from storytelling, not just reading a book like Teresa said. The first one where it says develop communication. I ask a question, what is a loom? Rachel had to communicate back to me what that was. A lot of times when we're talking about in a story that we can ask a question where children have to talk is a great way for them to come up with new words. As we read different books, one of the great things about reading books is that we say words that we don't normally say in our normal day language. And so as we're reading stories, they're learning new vocabulary, learning how to communicate. Another one that we're gonna really talk about is that it's a springboard to read reading. As I use this story, the one thing that we do is we can create another story. If I said, silly Lauren went to town walking backwards upside down on the way she saw a, a cow, silly cow, it was eating some grass. Okay, that's what we cause, call cause and effect. And that's how children start to tell the story. It actually means they're pretty smart when you think about it. Is they saw a cow, it was eating some grass, okay? And that is what they first do. As they get older, they actually move to more of the cause and effect adding to rhyming. Remember, and this is really good for young parents to remember, is rhyming is a learned literacy behavior. It takes practice, and the more we hear those rhymes, the more they can learn. But when they're telling their own stories, they're having to think of cause and effect, and on top of that, rhyme, and that's pretty hard. Okay, silly Melanie went to town, walking backwards, upside down, on the way she saw a... Cat. A cat, silly cat, it wore a hat. Thank you for an easy word. Um, and that is the next step. It actually had some comprehension, the cause and effect, and then it rhymed. That's what you're gonna look for with children. This story is so fun with that springboard to reading because it helps children think about what comes next, what could happen after that. So that's the springboard to reading. When it comes to giving something to do in the car, we sing this song a lot with my children. Now, my kids are pretty spread out. And so when my daughter loved playing this game, her older brother thought it was pretty silly and he didn't really like to participate. But it was interesting that as we were trying to come looking out the window, seeing different things, he was our best rhymer. He could come up with some pretty incredible things. Using our imagination, yes. A springboard to reading, yes. The another thing, it's bonding. As I've done this with my grandchildren, it's really funny, is I have a grandson that's a pretty serious little gentleman. And one night we were walking home, we went on a walk, and all of a sudden, Grandma, hold me, hold me, I'm tired. Well, he's too big for me to hold. And so I started singing this song. Silly Reese went to town. He's like, I am not silly, Grandma. So then it was, handsome Reese, don't use my name. Okay, so then I had to be silly grandma went to town. And then, but he was the one that was coming up with the stories. And so actually it's a story that now I've pa used with my own children, I'm passing it on to my other kids. Um, one thing develops muscle coordination. Dancing the jig, leapfrog, that's hard. But as a story, your children can be doing that with you. 
We know that children are sensory um, learners. The more they use their sensor, their sensors, their senses, like um, feeling, touching, hearing, those kind of things, they're better learners. Okay, so. There's so many benefits to um, storytelling. Nourishes the mind, gives us something to think about. I remember teaching this class um, years ago in a school, and I was actually in a history class, and it just said, history is somebody's story. Wow, that's incredible, isn't it? Another benefit um, that Scholastic found with storytelling is that it solves problems in a safe environment. We can tell a story to solve problems. Now, as we think of the benefits, and you think of how I told Silly Sally, we solved a problem, didn't we? We helped her get to town walking backwards upside down. There's some more maybe serious stories that we can tell to help children understand life. Now, as we talk about storytelling, there's five tools that you as a storyteller need to to do to be a good storyteller. And we're going to focus on each one of those tools. As we talk about tools of storytelling, there's five. And we've used one of them, imagination. And we're going to talk about the next four of them. And then we're going to incorporate them with some clips from PBS shows and some activities and some books that you can use. Now, I tell a story one way, Tori tells it a different way. And one thing that I've learned is when we use these tools, they'll be as individual as a person using them that's telling the story. And so don't try to be somebody else. Take the tools that we're going to talk about and use them to the best of your ability. Once again, as we said in the first, storytelling takes practice. And so for me, some of the think tools that we have to use come a little bit harder. Some of them come easier. I'm just going to go very quickly through what the tools are. And then we're going to take each one of them and we're going to show some PBS clips with each tool and some books that you use and then we're going to practice some of the things to be a good storyteller. The first one we've already mentioned which is imagination and as we've said imagination works on the person telling the story and the person that's listening. Now I always sort of say this as a child could you make up great stories if your parents ask you where you were till three in the morning could you come up with something very good you probably have a good imagination if you can do that. I don't. I have to rely on a lot of books to give me my ideas and actually to help me tell a story. I don't have that great imagination. If you do, use it because some of the best stories are those stories that you just think up on your own. The next one is a voice. It's how you say the story. The next one is expression, and that is right here, what your face says with the story. Then we have gestures. The last one is a problem. A story needs a good problem. It needs that climax. It needs something to make you interested into listening to that. And so we're going to take each one of those tools and we're going to discuss them a little bit further. And first, we're going to talk about imagination. In this next clip, we see with Super Y, and Super Y is such a great show to introduce your children to storytelling because they have those original storybook characters that we read about, and you can take them, and what they do is they use their imagination. They come up with a problem. What do we do to solve it? Now, watch as the storybook characters figure out how do we get up Jack's beanstalk? How do we do it? They use their imagination, their problem solving to help them do it. Super readers to the rescue. It's time to fly with the super readers because we've got a problem to solve. Super readers to the rescue. With my amazing alphabet tools, I can build alphabet stairs to climb up this beanstalk. Say the letters with me. A, B, C, D. What letter is next? E! 
Yes. E. F. G. H. I. J. K. L. M. Hmm. What letter comes after M? Come on, guys. M. <laughs> yes. It's N. O. P. Q. R. S. T. U. V. W. X. Y. And what's the last letter? Uh, Z. 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 Lick the letters. We made it to the top of the beanstalk. Okay, very original way to solve a problem of how do we get up Jack's beanstalk. One thing to remember as you use imagination, that imagination helps children become good problem solvers. When they can create a scenario, when they can think of something that, oh, how am I gonna do it? It helps them as they get older be a good problem solver. Now, Candace, can you use different accents and sound like a cowboy or sound like a queen? When you tell a story? Not very often. Not very often. My husband does a very good job with this. He watches a movie and can sound like a pirate or watches another movie and sound like a German. I cannot do that. In fact, I went to the Timpanoga Storytelling Festival and I went to a storytelling class to help me with my voice to be a better storyteller because I can't do those accents. If I try, it just messes up the story. I forget where I'm at and I'm concentrating so hard on making an accent that it doesn't work. And so it's not who I am. And so in the storytelling um, festival class, they talked about with your voice, go high, low, fast, slow. If you can do the accents, do it. If you can't, don't worry about it. Know where it's important to pause. Know where you can speed up. You know, make your voice go high and then drop it down low. Now, voice is probably, as Teresa said, one of the most important tools when you tell a story is how we do communicate. In this clip we're gonna show with, through the show Between the Lions, Chicken Jane doesn't have a voice. She has gestures, she has expression, she has a problem, but because she doesn't have a voice, it makes her life very difficult. Watch and see. And now, fun with Chicken Jane. Today, Chicken Jane and the Red Elephant. Look, look, see, see, coming down the lane. Here comes Scott, here comes Dot, here comes Chicken Jane. Look, Dot, look. See the elephant on the sled. Yes, Scott, yes. The elephant on the sled is red. Look, Scott, look. See Chicken Jane write the letters G, E, T, G, N. Get. Now see her write the letters A, W, A, Y. Away. Get away. Get away, Dot. Get away. Look, Scott, look. Chicken Jane is wet. We are not wet. Thank you, Chicken Jane. Look, look, see, see, going up the lane. There goes Scott, there goes that, there goes Chicken Jane. Oh my goodness, if only Chicken Jane had a voice. Now you have a voice and we're going to use it right now. I want you to think of the word O. Oh. And I'm gonna give you some scenarios and you're going to use your voice to tell me how you're feeling. And the first one is think of the word O oh, and you know what? You told your husband he needed gas in his car. You know, and
then he's like, oh, I'll get it tomorrow. Or your wife, John, if it's your wife, you need to put gas in your car. You're almost out. And the next day he calls and he says, I ran out of gas. So with a lack of concern on one, two, three, say, oh, one, two, three. Oh. oh. See, you can do it. Let's practice again. Okay, let's think of a 16-year-old. Can I please take your brand new car on my date? Pleading. One, two, three. Oh. oh. Now, my you kids usually go, oh, 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 please, please. You know, it's the three O's. <gasps> it's payday. One, two, three. Oh. oh. Now, you guys did that good. Um, your daughter said that she cleaned her room, but she's only been in there five minutes. One, two, three. Oh. Okay, you guys can do that. Let's see if I have one more. You know, with that paycheck, you got a great big bonus. One, two, three. Oh. Okay, that's as easy as using your voice. Now, I want to tell you about a series of books that really have helped me use my voice. I don't use a lot of accents, remember? I have to do that high, low, fast, slow, dilly. And that is by the author Robert Munch. Now, most of you probably have this book in your library. It's I Love You Forever, I Love You For Always, As Long As I'm Living, My Baby You'll Be. This was the very first Robert Munch book I ever bought. It made me cry. I have three boys. When I read it, I think of my children. And so the next time I saw a Robert Munch book, I just grabbed it and thought, now I can't say that it was this one, but I bought it and it was silly and sort of not stupid, but just a little, not this tender loving story like I Love You Forever. Now, Robert Munch is a Canadian storyteller and he tells lots of stories. In fact, he says he tells a story at least a hundred times before he writes it down. He uses his words a lot. And the one thing that you'll notice about Robert Munch when you're seeing his, he's going to show you where to use your voice to make the story come alive. And one of my favorite, one thing about Robert Munch is he takes everyday situations. This one's called Alligator Baby, about having a baby. They bring home instead of a baby, an alligator. And he takes these everyday experiences and he exaggerates them and he makes them silly. One of them called smelly socks. One of them's called I'm so embarrassed. But my all time favorite, once again, because I have three boys, it's called More Pies. Okay. Now in this book, More Pies, I need your help. And we're going to go chalk, chuck a chuck a chuck a chomp. Okay. So let's say it together. Chuck a chuck a chuck a chomp. Okay, whenever the character eats, we're going to do this. And he eats a lot because he's a boy. Now, having three boys, we could just have finished dinner. The dishes are in the dishwasher, and my kids will say, Mom, I'm starving. And so when I read this book, it just had, it brought back very fond memories of me raising my boys. So I'm going to tell it to you. Now, I could read it, but I would probably mess it up because I've told it more than I've said it. So we'll just start with the first picture. Samuel woke up really hungry. He went downstairs and said, Mom, I'm starving. So she gave him a big, big bowl of cereal and he ate it really fast. <gasps> chuck it, chuck it, chomp. He finished it as quick as that and said, Mom, I'm still so hungry. So she got out a really big salad bowl. She filled it with three boxes of, of cereal and a gallon of milk. And Samuel ate it really fast. Check it, check it, chomp. Mom, can I have more? I'm still hungry. She made him three stacks of pancakes, two milkshakes, and a fried chicken. And Samuel ate those as fast as he could. Check it, check it, chomp. Mom, more, please, more. Samuel, you're a growing boy. Now go outside and play. Samuel went outside. Oh, I'm starving. Rolling on the ground, I'm so hungry. His little brother came up to him and said, Samuel, if you're so hungry, why don't you go to the pie eating contest at the park? 
So Samuel went to the bus stop, got on the bus, and went to the park. He walked right up to the judge and said, give me pies. The judge looked at him and said, go home, you're just a little kid. Well, there were three people all ready for the pie eating contest. Now you guys need to help me remember this. A lumberjack, a fireman, and a construction worker. And the construction worker said, he's just a little kid, let him eat some pies. So Samuel climbed up at the table and the judge gave everybody one peach pie. One, two, three, eat! And they ate their pies really fast. <gasps> chuck it, chuck it, stop! Oh, the fireman turned green and fell under the table. My tummy hurts, he said. Amazing, said the judge. Samuel, can you still eat more pies? Samuel looked at him and said, not hungry anymore, but I could eat another pie. So the judge gave everybody two cherry pies and he ate them really fast. Chuck it, chuck it, chomp. Oh, the construction worker fell over. Oh, my stomach hurts. I want my mommy. Amazing, said the judge. He gave them each three blueberry pies and they ate them really fast. <gasps> chuck, 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 chuck. Who's left? Lumberjack. The lumberjack held his stomach. Oh, I can't eat anymore. Samuel, you win the prize pie. So Samuel got a big pie, took it home and ate it on the bus as he rode home. He walked into the house and his mom said, Samuel, I knew you were so hungry, so I made you pies for lunch. Oh, Samuel turned green and fell under his table. But his little brother said, mmm, pies. chuck a chuck a chump Okay, that's using your voice. We did the high-low. I hope you saw the high-low, the fast and slow. As you use your voice, make it true to who you are. If you can use accents, let's have a show of hands. Who can use accents in here and does that very well? No one? There's usually a couple people that can. So if you can, do it. If you can't, still be true to you. But you can make the voice go to where you need it to go. We're going to now move on to gestures. I have to say, this is me, okay? Have you noticed, if you've watched me, I walk around, I use my hands, I'm always trying to tell a story with my hands. In fact, I remember I was invited to go down to SUU to present at a conference down there, and they were trying to tell me where to park. And she was explaining the building, and I said, oh, you mean that? And I'm on the phone going like, with a little booth thingy? And she's like, what are you talking about? Because I'm on the phone doing this. So gestures is something that comes naturally to me. I don't have to practice it as much as I do actually memorizing a story and using my voice, but it's something that comes naturally to me. How many use your body language to tell a story or even to maybe to make a discussion? Anybody in here? Okay, so that is one thing that you can use. And the one thing about gestures is children can use it too. Again, imagination and gestures are something that the children can be a part of so they can develop those gross motor skills while you're telling a story. In this clip we're going to watch, you're going to see that the gestures or the body language that Word Girl uses to show how she's feeling. Come on, just try it. I don't think it sounds right. How do you know if you don't try? Trust me, I can tell. Come on, what do you have to lose? How about my reputation? And what does reputation mean? It means what people think of you. Ah, well thank you, Word Girl. Please. <sighs> Fine, but just this once. <clears throat> Welcome, viewers, to another exciting adventure of the super sweet and really strong princess. Who also knows vocabulary. Who also knows vocabulary. I like it. Are you kidding? No. It'll never fit on a t-shirt. <laughs> Okay, just by her body language, you knew exactly how she was feeling. And that's how I am. You usually know by my body language how I'm feeling. This is one of my favorite books about gestures. Just looking at the characters, very, very few words in this book, but the way that the characters hold themselves, how they look, explains the whole story. 
Yo, yes. Yo. Yes. Hey. Who? Yo. <gasps> Me? Yes, you. Oh. What's up? Not much. Why? No fun. Oh, no friends. Look at that body language, just hunched over as small as he can be, trying to be invisible. Oh, yes. Look! Hmm? Me! Y you? Yes, me! You? Well, well, yes, yo, yo. Okay, we go from, look at how open his body is, is before was the, no friends. You know, it's just his body language that tells that. When you pick books with the kids, you can actually have them do it. How would you feel if? Use their body language. Um, there's other books that you can use. One that I've liked is called um, A Duck Stuck. And I like to use this with kids when I want them to settle down. I actually get them stuck to their chairs and then they get stuck in the muck and you can stick them and they still can be using their gestures and their body language, but they also can be sitting down. Now gestures is, like I said, something that comes naturally for me so I don't have to practice it as much. But if it doesn't for you, then practice it. Find books like Where the Wild Things Are, where you roar your terrible roar and gnash your terrible teeth and claw those kind of things where you can use those gestures. In that story where the wild things are, they danced a rumpus. And then there's nothing there because you're supposed to be rumpusing, okay? So using gestures in books, a lot of times you can tell a story and use them or read a book and still use those gestures. I want you now to sit up like a regal queen or king, okay? Now I want you to look like you're a bored third grade. Well, now seventh grader. How about a bored seventh grader? Oh, how about a curious person looking over at what they have? See, those are the kind of things that you can do with gestures. The next two we're going to talk about together, and that is expression and problems. Now, um, expression is a lot like gestures, but it happens right here. It's what your face tells the story. And so when you're telling a story, usually if you're using a lot of gestures, your face will always follow behind. Now, um, one book that I like about expression is another book by Audrey Wood. Her husband is the illustrator, Don Wood. And the main character never says a word. But by his facial expression, you know how he's feeling. You know what he's thinking, and he doesn't have to talk. So watch as I read the story, just his expression that's telling the, his story. Hello, little mouse. What are you doing? Oh, I see. You're going to pick that red ripe strawberry. Oh, but little mouse, haven't you heard about the big hungry bear? Oh, how that bear loves red ripe strawberries. The big hungry bear can sm smell a red ripe strawberry a mile away, especially one that has just been picked. Boom, boom, boom. The bear will tromp through the forest on his big hungry feet and <gasps> Find the strawberry, no matter where it's hidden or who's guarding it or how it's disguised. Oh, quick, there's only one way in the whole wide world to save the red strawberry from the big hungry bear. Cut it in two, share half of it with me and we'll both eat it up, yum! Now that's one red ripe strawberry the big hungry bear will never get. The end. Nothing that he says, but his whole face shows everything that he's feeling. Now we saw a problem in there about that big hungry bear.
And in this next clip, every good story has a problem. It doesn't matter if it was Silly Sally who needed to get to town, or Samuel that was so hungry, or in this story, how am I going to save my strawberry? A story has to have a good problem for a kid to stay involved with it. Now in this next clip, I want you to watch both for every tool that we've talked about. The imagination, the gestures, the voice, the expression, and the problem that is solved just in a very short clip be with between the lions. The quest for the chest, written by uh, Babs Kaplan. You remember that Lady Esther and Lester the Jester were on the quest for the chest. Right, yes. right. And they went to Count Chester's castle. Yes. yes. That is the weirdest Christmas carol I've ever heard. Oh, we request that you give us this chest. You may have the chest if you pass a test. I shall write the word chest on a piece of paper. And a guest on another. If you choose the chest paper, you get the chest. Oh, boy. If you choose the guest, you will be a guest in my dungeon forever. Oh, boy. We'll take the test. Count Chester was tricky. He wrote guest on both pieces of paper, so they could not win. That one. What's it say, hmm? But Lady Esther suspected that the detestable Chester would cheat, so she cooked up a plan. She tossed the paper into the fire. Gack! Now how will we know what was written on that paper? Then, Lady Esther took the other paper from Chester's hand and read it. It said... <clears throat> guest. This one says guest, so the one that I chose and threw into the fire must have said... Chest. Right? <sighs> grumble, grumble. She's best at me. <laughs> yes, she's right. She's right. We got the chest. She's right. She's right. <laughs> Lady Esther had bested Chester. So she and Lester the Jester took the chest back home where it belongs. Now we got the chest, the one that we just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> We want to just wrap this up about storytelling by talking about how storytelling really can bond us, how it really tells our story. I want to share a couple books that, with you and read just the ending of one. One is called Tar Beach, and it's about a girl, a real life girl actually, that tells her story in this, that would go up on her apartment roof and lay on her tar roof, and it became her tar beach. Anybody grow up in California here that actually had a sand beach that they actually could go to and lay out on? Okay, nobody? Now in Utah, we don't have a tar beach. We have what we call a trampoline. Now a trampoline is where kids go out on the summer or in the winter, depends on where it's at, and they lay there and they dream about their lives. They dream about what's going to happen. They think about what their family is going through. And that's this story. I love taking this story to kids and saying, where's your tar beach? Is it at a swing set? Mine usually as a little girl was on a swing. As I was swinging, I would think of stories. I would think about my life. I would think about my grandparents. I would think about things that I wanted to happen for me. Where's your tar beach? 
Find a tar beach for your children. As I said, in Utah, it's a lot of trampolines. The next story that I want to talk about, actually, when we bought it, it was about the sequencing, the sequencing of the year. But as I read it, I realized where it really has the true message of storytelling. So I want to share this one last story with you. I'm not going to read it all. I'm going to read just the end of it and think about the importance of storytelling. There's four little field mice that have to get ready for the winter. And and the one little field mice, his name was Frederick. Well, Frederick just sat on the rocks and looked at the colors. And so when it was time for winter, this is what happened. In the beginning, there was lots to eat. And the mice told silly stories of foolish fox and silly cats. And they were a happy family. But little by little, they nibbled up most of the nuts and berries. And the straw was gone. And the corn was only a memory. It was cold in the wall, and no one felt like chatting. Then they remembered what Frederick had said about the sun rays, and the colors, and the words. What about your supplies, Frederick, they said. Close your eyes, said Frederick, as he climbed onto a big stone. Now I send you the rays of the sun. Do you feel the golden glow? And as Frederick spoke of the sun, the four little mice began to feel warmer. Was it Frederick's voice or was it magic? And now about the colors, Frederick, they asked anxiously. Close your eyes again, Frederick said. And when he told them of the periwinkles and the red poppies in the yellow wheat and the green leaves of the berry bushes, they saw the colors as clearly as if they had been painted in their minds. And the words, Frederick, Frederick cleared his voice, waited for a moment, and then, if from a stage said, who scatters the snowflakes? Who melts the ice? Who spoils the weather? Who makes it nice? Who grows the four-leaf clovers in the June? Who dims the daylight? Who lights the moon? Four little field mice who live in the sky. Four little field mice like you and I. One of the spring mice who turns on the showers. Then comes summer who paints the flowers. The fall, mo fall mouse is next with walnuts and wheat. And winter is last with little cold feet. Aren't we lucky the seasons are four? Think of a year of one less or one more. When Frederick was finished, they all applauded. But Frederick, they said, you're a poet. Frederick blushed, took a bow, and said, I know it. My suggestion to you is take your personal stories and share them. Use those tools that we've talked about. Use your imagination. Let the people imagine what you're telling the story about. Use your voice your body language, your gestures, your expression, and make sure you have a good story to tell and it will be beneficial to your whole family.